and welcome everyone to the third webinar in our Open Water Swim Week. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is Louise Wright, I'm the Interim CEO of Triathlon Scotland. Before we get started for the evening, um, I'd just like to run through a couple of house point, housekeeping points. Firstly, if we can ask that you please keep your microphones muted at all times to prevent any interruptions. We would also encourage you to keep your cameras on if possible. Um, this will really help us and Michael sort of see the interaction and yeah, just make it slightly more interactive as well. The only caveat to that is we are recording the session. So if you don't want to feature it, then you can turn off your camera. Um, if you have any questions at all, please enter them in the chat box. Um, we'll do our best to answer them, but we'll probably leave them to the end for Michael. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce Michael Avril this evening, who is the RNLI Regional Water Safety Lead um, and the Chair of Water Safety Scotland. Um, Michael is in a fortunate position and he tries to prevent drowning in both his day job, but also volunteering as an RNLI crew member and as Chair of Water Safety Scotland. So I'm sure Michael's presentation will also be filled with real life stories for us um, and learning points to take away. So Michael, delighted to hand over to you for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, unfortunately, I've got absolutely no real life stories, but loads that I'll probably make up to get my point across. Thank you very much. I'm um, just going to shift a couple of bits and pieces around here on my screen so that I can see everybody. Um, first off, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for allowing me to come along this evening to talk to you a little bit about keeping safe in the open water. And by the open water, I mean mainly the the North Sea, um, or the Irish Sea, or even the places further south. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through a few of the bits and pieces that I would like to discuss this evening, and we'll open up at the end for a question and answer session. So to begin, hopefully now everybody can see introductions at the top of my screen. If somebody could just give me a thumb up to tell me that you can see things moving. Great, absolutely brilliant. So I'm here uh, as part of my role with the RNLI or the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. We've been saving lives at sea for over 200 years. A lot of people know that we've been about for a considerable amount of time, but what a lot of people don't know is that we've actually been involved in prevention for over 100 years. And that prevention activity actually started out with the introduction of barometers for fishermen in fishing villages. And if you're lucky enough to wander around some of the fishing villages in Scotland, quite often you'll see in old lifeboat station and some um, traditional buildings that are within the villages, you sometimes see the shape of a barometer in a wall, or if you're really lucky, you might actually see the original Fitzroy bar barometer that was there. So we've been doing it quite a considerable amount of time because we understand that it makes a difference. We are powered by volunteers and donations. I'm in the very fortunate position to be paid by the RNLI for my day-to-day -day job, but I also volunteer as an RNLI crew member as well, and that's all done free of charge. We operate 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, one of the things that I was just going to point out tonight is that if you hear a sudden um, beep, 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 probably followed quite quickly by a few expletives and me running out the door. I'm on call tonight as ILB Helm for berwick on tweed Lifeboat Station. So um, never off call, never off call. Our work with partners and organisations, we try to educate, influence and supervise and rescue those at risk from drowning. So we try to do so many different things to make sure that people are safe. We are totally separate from the Coast Guard, but we do work very, very closely together. Is there any members of Her Majesty's Coast Guard here this evening? Put a quick message in the, the chat. Nobody admitting to it, which is absolutely brilliant because I can tell you all my good stories about the Coast Guard when they got it wrong. Well, 95% of us are volunteers, only 5% of us are staff members. And the question that I always ask when I meet people is, do you know who I am? It usually raises a few eyebrows, but I find it's an ideal way to 
you know, sort of to, to make people feel at ease. There's quite often that I'll actually ask myself, who the heck are you? What are you doing to have such a wonderful job that you absolutely love and even better that you get paid for it? It's taken years and years and years of devotion to being a lifeboat crew member, being a volunteer. And yes, I am lucky enough to work for the RNLI full time, which means that actually 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, my whole reason to tantra is to try and prevent drowning fatalities. And some of the information that I have today will hopefully help you with your open water swimming, especially when you're going into the sea. So the aims of this presentation, I've just explained who the RNLI are and how we operate. I'm hoping to be able to give you some steps to enjoy your open water experience, how to call us in an emergency, how to prevent false calls, a little bit about hazards that might be out there and how you might be able to control them. And we're going to finish off with a question and answer session at the end. So a little bit about the RNLI in Scotland. The bit that most people have a little bit of understanding about, they've probably seen the pictures before, they know that we do lifeboats. These great big orange and blue things that cost an absolute flip and fortune, but save lives at sea. That boat that you're looking at there is approximately 25 years old. And when it was originally produced, it cost just over a million pounds. We made such a good job of building them to such a high specification when we did build them that actually at the end of their 25 year lifespan, we're going to re-engine them, put new computers in, and they're going to be good for another 25 years. So a really good investment for us. The workhorse of the RNLI, the D-Class, inshore lifeboat, um, nothing more than an inflatable mattress, which is half the reason why I have bad knees and a really sore back. But some of the other things that we do that you might not be so aware of is we have lifeguards in Scotland. We've got six beaches, five in Fife and one in Coldingham Bay down in the Scottish borders. And again, another thing that we get involved in quite considerably is doing some prevention activity. We have volunteers that are trained up to be able to give relevant safety advice depending on the activity that you want to carry out. So steps to enjoy your open water experience. Now, when I say enjoy it, um, the thought of going into freezing cold water, um, jellyfish, sharks, all of these things, enjoy it's maybe pushing it a little bit too far, but to be able to have an experience where you're not so stressed that it becomes something that you don't want to do again. And the, to me, the best steps that you can do to enjoy that is the five Ps. Prior preparation prevents performance, or pre prevents problems is what we would say there and betters your performance. So a little bit about that. One of the first things I'm gonna talk about is what can you do before you actually go swimming? So always tell someone where you're going, when you'll be back. And the most important part of that, this, question, this statement is what to do if you don't return. So we are called out quite a few times, um, summertime, wintertime, autumn time, springtime, all the way through the year by somebody who's concerned saying, Jimmy's been away swimming. He said that he was going to be back by six o'clock. It's half past 10. The pubs have kicked out. He should have been back by now. So you've got somebody that possibly left their home at four o'clock in the afternoon to go and do a bit of open water swimming or canoeing, kayaking, sailing. And we're now talking six and a half hours later. There are certain parts around about the coast of Scotland where the tide will be operating in anything from about two to four knots. Six hours at four knots means that you could have traveled 24 miles in one particular direction or a multitude of directions. And that gives us one heck of a big area to be able to search. So what's, why is it important to tell somebody what to do if you don't return? Is have a plan. Speak to that person that's staying ashore and say, well, I'm going swimming. I'm leaving here. I'll be in the water at four. I'll be out the water at quarter to five. Don't panic at five o'clock. 
give me till quarter past five. I'll send you a quick text because I know that I've got a mobile phone signal there. And if you don't hear from me at quarter past five, try phoning me just in case I've forgotten. And only start press the, the big red panic button at about somewhere around about half past five, quarter to six in the evening. So we've only got an hour roughly where somebody has possibly been missing or been in trouble which makes a big, big difference to that search area that we're trying to cover. Top tip for you, whoever it is that is staying at home that you're relying on to be your lifeline, be nice to them. Yeah, make sure that the insurance document is not sitting on the table before you go out and they've just suddenly discovered that you're worth more dead than you are alive. Be nice to that person, always a good idea. Buddy up. Try not to do any of this type of activity alone. It's, it's a social event. It's always better to swim with somebody else. It also gives you somebody that you can swim against or swim with, or possibly even somebody just to have a chat with, but it doubles your hope of survival if somebody else is there that is able to look after you if something goes wrong. And likewise, you're there to help somebody else if it goes wrong for them. Location. Think about the location you're going to be going swimming in. If you've never been there before, try and get as much information about that particular area as you possibly can. Speak to other people that have swam in that area. Speak to other people that do open water swimming. You could call the Coast Guard, you could talk to locals, but most people have a good understanding of their local area and good places to swim, bad places to swim. But if you're traveling 30, 40 miles to a place that you've never been before, you won't have that luxury. So think about not just where you can get into the water, but also how you're going to get out. So one of the things that I was always taught as part of my scuba diving years, and it also, you know, talking about being in the water, is the most dangerous place that you can be is actually close to shore. You don't want to be spending too much time where you're going to be hit by surf, waves, currents, where the rocks are right close inside or close beside you. So think about that. You want to spend as little as possible time in that area as you can. So think about how you're going to get in. Don't just jump off the seawall and think that's great. I'm in the water. I can go and do my little bit of swimming and then come back and find out you've got the best part of 15 feet to climb up a vertical ladder or worse yet, there's no ladder to be able to climb out and you're going to have to swim for the best part of a mile to be able to get out of that particular area. So check that exit as well as the entry. And also try and figure out if there's any local hazards that you need to be aware of. Um, starting in reverse order, sandbanks. Yeah, the amount of people that have jumped in off a seawall or off the edge and hit a sandbank that's just under the water that you can't see or a rock, it doesn't um, go down well. It can do some serious danger to you. Be careful of wildlife as well. Um, has anybody here ever been attacked by a seal? I have. <laughs> it's not a nice experience. That little cute thing full of fluff that you see sitting on the beach that you think, oh, isn't that nice? I'll go and see if I can maybe give it a clap. They have teeth. They have big teeth. They have teeth that are covered in all sorts of bacteria. So keep that in mind. Things like jellyfish. If you ask any child round about the, the UK, you know, what's the biggest danger of going swimming? They'll always say sharks, but we haven't had too many shark incidents any time that I can remember. But yeah, certainly things like weaver fish are a big danger, um, jellyfish, and th also things, the mammals such as seals, etc. And also hydrology. Think about how that water might be reacting to the physical presences round about it. Is there a groin underneath there? Is there a great big rock that's just underneath the surface? Because that will always affect the way that that water interacts with the physical obstruction. Weather. Please check the weather forecast. Don't rely on just one weather forecast. Go to your trusted weather forecast that you've used before. And please, please don't look at five different weather forecasts and choose the best one and say that's definitely how it's going to be today. Sod's law dictates the worst one is more likely. Keep an eye on the tides. Try to get an understanding if you can 
get a hold of it is a things like a, a nautical chart, which will tell you which direction the tide will be flowing at certain stages of the tide, but local knowledge as well. Ask the locals, see if you can figure out what that tide's doing. Be aware of high tide, low tides, spring tides and neat tides all have different effects on your ability to be able to swim in a certain area. And if you're in a river, how fast is the stream? Is it affected by the tide? Because you might be swimming in a river which is close by a beach and it can be affected by the tide. Where I live in berwick upon tweed we've probably got about the best part of four or five miles upriver which is affected by the tide and make a considerable distance to your ability to be able to swim. Also think about heavy rainfall. Top tip from me, uh, through bitter experience, is be aware of heavy rainfall and the effect it's going to have on that local area. The first time that you're in swimming or diving and that you find that the sewerage outfall is also connected up to the storm drains and heavy water is going to flush everything that was in that storm drain or that sewerage back out past you, it's, a, it's an experience that I certainly don't want to be looking at again. But check out things like SEPA who can tell you about the quality of the water in the area that you're going to be swimming in. Planned releases. Yep. If you're lucky enough to live up in the Oban area, um, you've got the River Aw and you've got some lovely beaches around about the River Aw, but also you've got a great big lock which is upriver from there where they control the amount of water that is in that lock at all times. So if you give the, the control room a call, they'll actually tell you when they're releasing water into that river course, which again can make a big, big difference if you're swimming in the river or where the river meets the sea. Rip currents, how to spot them and how to deal with them. There is a science to rip currents. I'm not going to say I'm an expert, but local knowledge will tell you where there are rip currents. There's also usually warning signs. And, you know, the, there is a way of checking and there's some really good videos online, check out YouTube, things like that, which will tell you a little bit more about how to spot a rip current. So if you do get stuck in a rip current, there's certain things that you can do to help yourself. Rip currents usually start when the surf is up. So look out for rough weather conditions because the more waves that you've got coming into the beach, the more water that ends up on the beach, the more water that has to leave that beach will form a rip current and push you out to sea. Before entering the water, stand at an elevating position to survey the conditions. Rip currents are easy to spot from higher up. So usually you can see broken water and then you'll see a channel where the water is returning back towards the sea. So yep, you can usually spot that from a, an elevated position. If you do get caught in one, don't try to swim against it. If you can stand, try to wade rather than swim. If not, swim parallel to the shore because it's usually a funnel. So you may be pushed further out to sea, but you know, two or three lengths, um, you know, two or three meters away from you, you'll actually find that you're out of that main current and you're into slack water, which means that you can start to come back towards the shore again. If you do get caught in any of one of these rip currents, please raise your hand and shout for help. Okay. The right equipment is also very important. Wear a wetsuit. Wetsuit doesn't just keep you warm, it also gives you some buoyancy. There may be hardy individuals around about, you know, within this meeting that would prefer to swim um, a pair of speedos. Uh, or a swimming costume, a bikini, whatever it is that you want to swim in. But please, please have a think about the benefits of wearing a wetsuit, not just to keep you warm, but also, as I say, it gives you some extra buoyancy. W try to wear a brightly coloured swimming hat and take a toe float when you go swimming or dipping. What's the best colour to, we to wear? Well, actually, there's been a whole load of research done on that. And the best colour you can wear is multicoloured. Because in certain conditions, black shows up well. Other conditions, white shows up well. Fluorescent yellow is good. Fluorescent orange is good as well. But, you know, depending on those conditions, you need to have a think about it, which one's going to be seen best. Bright orange is usually a good, um, a good one that people think, oh, yeah, I've got a bright orange one. 
But if there is a rescue craft looking for you, remember that most of those lobster pots that are in there will have an orange boy on the top with a small flag. So is that the person in the water that we're looking for, that we're searching for, or is that a lobster pot? A mixture is usually better. Always take a means of calling for help with you, such as a mobile phone in a waterproof pouch and a whistle to attract attention. Another top tip for me is do not test your brand new iPhone 12 within a waterproof case first time you go swimming. <laughs> Yeah, put something else in there that doesn't cost the best part of a grand whilst you're testing out that waterproof case. Yeah, been there, done that one, ruined one on a lifeboat shout one night where unfortunately the, what I thought was a waterproof pouch had a hole in it. So yeah, be aware of that, but yet yeah, carrying your phone in a mobile, uh, sorry, your mobile phone in a waterproof case like that, you can use it if you get into trouble. Anybody that's watched Saving Lives at Sea, there's been numerous instances of people kayaking and swimming. Um, there was one with a stand-up paddleboard where they actually managed to use their, their bit of equipment to float on and call for help using their mobile phone. A whistle, trying to shout on somebody in the water, actually hearing that person shouting is very, very difficult, whereas a high-pitched whistle is so much easier for us to hear. It's recognized as a distress signal. So continuous sounding of a whistle is a distress. Whereas somebody shouting could be the kids playing on the beach. It could be somebody fishing off the rocks with no idea. Whistle is your best bet. And funnily enough, you can whistle longer than you can shout. The other good thing about a whistle is if you think about using a whistle and blowing on it, your mouth is closed, very important. If you shout, you're opening your mouth. Again, Sod's Law comes into it. If you open your mouth, that's when the wave hits you or that's where you say it start to sink underneath the water and you start to intake water, which is never a good thing. If you're blowing through a whistle, you're constantly blowing out and you've got a very small area that you could possibly take water back in again. Make sure you have plenty of warm clothes and keep a warm drink for after your swim. As much as I love a fine Isley malt, please don't be tempted to take a hip flask and have a dram after your swim, okay? Because of hypothermia and some of the other things that can go wrong. Safe tracks. Safe tracks is a system that has been marketed by the Royal Yachting Association, originally designed for people that were sailing, canoeing, and doing the more um, traditional sports. However, they have now given you an option where you can use it when you're swimming. And I've got a short video clip here, which hopefully will play. Fingers crossed. Should be able to bring on here. Hello, I'm Rachel Andrews. Welcome to Everyday Athlete. On this week's episode, we're going to look at the RYA Safe Tracks app and how to use it to track your swim. The Safe Tracks app is aimed at boats, but it's certainly possible to set it up in order to use it for swimming. It's something I do all the time, and I'm going to share that with you now. Let's dig into it. This is the front page of the Safe Tracks app, and I'm going to click on Sail Plan. Michael, sorry, can sorry, video, but I don't know if that's just me. It's just okay. the audio, we can't see the video, sorry. You can't see the video, ah, right. Two seconds. Okay, now Thank we you. need to put in the vessel. Obviously I don't have a vessel because I'm... Technology. Oh yeah, it's because I'm sharing the screen oh, and, it's, <laughs> and it's because it's a screen rather than the actual app itself. Uh, right, screen one. Can everybody see that now? Yep. No. <laughs> Just the PowerPoint. 
just the PowerPoint, right. Uh, screen three, let's have a look at the PowerPoint. That's How's us. that? We're in action, Wait. thank you. <sighs> See, what a system, what a system. Use it to track your swim. The Safe Tracks app is aimed at boats, but it's certainly possible to set it up in order to use it for swimming. It's something I do all the time, and I'm gonna share that with you now. Let's dig into it. This is the front page of the Safe Tracks app, and I'm going to click on Sail Plan. First thing that comes up is an explanation of what a sail plan is. Take a little read of that at your leisure. Click OK. Now I need to put in the vessel. Obviously, I don't have a vessel because I'm swimming and I don't have a boat. So I'm going to call the vessel name Rach Swimming. Then I'm going to have to go through this part about a craft so that it's got some way of recording you. So I'm actually going to put in there other. And then in terms of length, I'm going to put my height, one meter 75. And draft, I'm going to put one meter. Uh, next thing, engine type, no engine, funnily enough. Uh, then I'm going to click other. And then the description, I'm going to put swimmer with bright cap, toe float, and wearing wetsuit or swimsuit. That should cover all eventualities. And I'm going to click save. Next thing I need to do is set the time of the length of the swim. So I'm going to say, for example, I might want to be in there for two hours. So I just move the dial around, select. Need to click the activity type now. So it could have been more than me, but actually it's just me on my own. Swimming. Next. If I wanted to add a new contact, you just follow the details. It can pull the contacts from your phone or you can just input them as you like. So I've already selected Superman. Next. Okay, now I'm going to look for my start point. And as I'm going to be swimming at Calshot, I'll just move my little um, icon down here. And I'm going to get in about here. So I hold the button there. Okay. Then optionally, I can put in a waypoint. Which I'm going to put... I'm going to circumnavigate the spit, I think. So that's my waypoint. And then I need to put in an end point. So as you can see, you can do all of this before you even get to your swim. So it can be pre-prepared so there's not so much messing about when you get to the beach. I don't have a checklist. That is optional. You could add something in there, but I don't. So now I just have a quick check over. I click set sail. This is what I do when I get down there. Do I want to send a, um, a text to my emergency contact? Well, yes, I do, because then they know where I am. So here's a copy of the text they'll get. I can add in any extra detail if I want to, but actually that, that's probably just enough information for them there. And then I can click send. And off I go. Should be quite a nice little swim. I've set the safe tracks off, so uh, let's see what we can do. This is the screen my emergency contact will see if they click on the link in the text. My position is updated every five minutes and the little boat icon gives my heading, speed and geographic position. When I've completed the trip, I can click end trip. Do I want to tell my emergency contact? Yes, I certainly do. This is something I do immediately as I get in the car after a swim. Click yes, I've arrived and then I'll send my little message. If I'm not back by the time I've said I will be, my emergency contact will get a message from Safe Tracks. With that message, they need to take action. There's two things they need to do. First of all, they need to have a look on the link in the original text to see if actually I'm on land and I've just forgotten to call. And then number two, they need to try and get hold of me by text or by phone. If neither of those work and they're still concerned, they need to contact the Coast Guard. Now the Coast Guard already knows where I am because they have access to the safe tracks information. So they're able to deploy help very quickly. One thing to be aware of is that safe tracks does require a mobile connection in order to start and end a sail plan and to update your location as you're swimming along. Make sure you have that connection before you get going, otherwise you could trigger a false alarm. I hope you've enjoyed this week's vlog and that you're gonna download the safe tracks app and have a go with it. Give me a like, drop me a comment and hit the subscribe button. It's great to have you along. Hello, I'm Rachel Andrews. Welcome to Everyday Athlete.
Okay then, hopefully now everybody can see the PowerPoint screen again. Somebody give me a thumb up. Aha, great, the system works. So as you can see, safe tracks for a, a rescuer is a really good bit of kit because it tells us where you are. It constantly updates every five minutes. It'll stop false calls because somebody can see whether or not you're actually sitting in the pub. Um, it can do all sorts of clever things, which makes a big difference to us. But yeah, as an open water swimmer or somebody used in the sea for leisure, it is a really good tool that they can use to keep themselves safe. So a little bit about the wonderful Scottish weather. 15 degrees air temperature means it's probably t-shirt weather or a major miracle. And that's centigrade we're talking about there, not Fahrenheit. However, 15 degrees in the water means that heat has been sucked out of your body 25 times faster and you'll get cold very, very quickly. Check the forecast before you go. The Met Office UK website is good for this, as are other options such as Wayfinder. Pay special attention to the wind and tides. Please, 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 if you're in any doubt whatsoever, don't go. It doesn't make you a wimp. It means that there's not an empty space at the table come a family meal. There will be many other days to swim. Please don't take unnecessary risks. And it's one of the downsides of my job is because I see so many incidents, I see so many things go wrong. It's made me hyper careful where, you know, I, I don't actually go diving anymore. But yet I still do enjoy the water, but just not in the more extreme sports. So acclimatization, it's really important for you to enter the water safely to avoid cold water shock. Splash water in your neck and face. Try not to hold your breath. Enter the water slowly. Cold water immersion can seriously affect your swimming ability. But it is something that you can build up a resistance to. So the more you do it, the longer that you do it, just taking it little bit by little bit, the more your body becomes acclimatized to it. And if you've got time, please go into things like YouTube. And if you Google Mike Tipton, he is the world renowned expert in cold water shock, does a lot of work with the RNLI Olympic athletes and all sorts of people. And he is the master of cold water shock and can tell you more. So why do people swim in open water? Open water swimming has become increasingly popular in the past 12 months. They've seen a huge rise in the number of people swimming. So the RNLI is working on it at the moment. You'll be pleased to see that it's not me in the wetsuit or even more still in a pair of swimming trunks. But hopefully this video clip is going to work. Can somebody give me a thumbs up when they can see it? Hi, I'm Nick and this is Liam. We both love going for cold water dips. We feel the benefits both physically and mentally. And we just arrived at the beach. Before getting into something like this, it's always best to check in with your doctor first, especially if you have underlying health conditions. And the safety tips in this video, they are for the cold water dippers like us who like to just bob around for five or 10 minutes, staying within our depth. It's really important that you never go alone. Always go with somebody else to a familiar spot that you're both used to. Before you dip or swim, check the weather forecast, including tidal information and swell height at that location. If you're in any doubt, stay out of the water. Don't go in, there's always another day that you can go for a swim. If you're heading down for a cold water dip, make sure you dress up really warm. Woolly hats, scarves, big coats, and stay as warm as you can right up until that last second before you get into the water. Your body temperature will drop so quickly once you're in that cold water, you really don't want to be too cold before you've even started. Wearing a wetsuit is always safest. This can increase your buoyancy and decrease the chances of cold water shock. A 
Acclimatise slowly and gradually when entering cold water. Start by splashing your face, your neck and your arms to adjust your body's temperature. Never jump or dive straight into the water as this can cause cold water shock, seriously impacting your ability in the water. It can literally take your breath away. Being in cold water will seriously impact your ability to swim. It's really important to stay within your depth and know your limits. Never take risks and always stay close to safe entry and exit points throughout your swim. Water is always moving and that is something you've got to stay hyper aware of. From the very first moment you get into the water, you might notice that it's pulling or drifting in a certain direction. That movement could sweep you into deep water or towards something dangerous. Always be seen by wearing a bright swim cap will increase your visibility in the water. And consider using a tow float too. It's a really good idea to take one of these while swimming or dipping in the water. A mobile phone in a waterproof pouch. Should you get into difficulties in the water, float on your back by extending your legs and your arms out the side. You can move your hands in a circular motion to help you float. Whilst on your back, try and remain calm, breathe normally, then reach for your phone pouch and dial 999 or 112 and ask for the Coast Guard. In that moment you first get out of the cold water, you might feel fine. You might almost feel like the air temperature is warm, but don't be lulled into a false sense of security because your body will still be cooling rapidly. Make sure you grab your changing robe, your big towel, put your woolly hat on and start to warm up gradually. Look after yourselves and one another. And remember, never go alone Climatize slowly, stay within your depth, always be seen, and in an emergency, call 999 or 112 and ask for the Coast Guard. Thanks for watching. If you found the video useful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Bye. Yeah, another top tip for me is never do your filming in November when your people are trying to grow a silly moustache for Movember because it makes them look really dodgy when they do these kind of film clips. But yeah, it's, you know, depending on your experience that you might have found that useful. Um, hopefully you did. It kind of summarises all the points. But again, that's something that's available through YouTube that you can share with people that are maybe just starting out and don't have that breadth of experience. So in an emergency, please call 999. If you're in the sea, you ask for the Coast Guard. OK, please don't be tempted to call the police or the ambulance or the fire service, because what will end up happening in Scotland is you get a multi um emergency service response. So if the fire brigade are called, they've got to respond. So because you send one fire engine to somebody that's in the water, they then will send the backup fire engine. Because you've got two fire engines, you've then got to send uh, a senior fire officer. Because you've got two fire engines and a senior fire officer, then you've then got to send an ambulance. Because you've got more than so many emergency services attending the one event, you've got to send a police car. Because you've sent a, and it just goes on and on and on and on. Whereas if you call the Coast Guard, they'll be able to deal with it and you will get a lifeboat to you as quickly as we possibly can. Please have a good idea of exactly where you are. OK, be aware that there will be signs that possibly like this one in Aberdeen, which has a safety number, which is a unique beach location code, which if you call the Coast Guard and give them that unique beach location code, they hold it on a, a fancy gazetteer system called Fintan and they know to almost the millimetre exactly where you're calling from. 
be aware if you start to use a local name of a swimming spot, it might not actually be on that gazetteer. And the person that you're dealing with on the phone could be anywhere in the UK or even Northern Ireland. So if there's a major incident going on in the Aberdeen Coast Guard area, what they will do is they'll transfer all their 999 calls to somewhere like Stornoway, Belfast, or possibly even Southampton. So you're not dealing with a local Coast Guard. So be aware of that. Don't use a local name, use a proper name because it might not be recognized. Do not enter the water to try and rescue somebody. All that ends up happening there is instead of looking for one person in the water in trouble, we're now looking for two who have entered the water at different times with different abilities and our search area just massively widens. If you can throw a life belt or a throw line, if you've ever tried to throw one of these life belts, you won't get it more than a couple of yards unless you're throwing it from a height. So look out for something like a throw line but call for help is the first thing that you should be doing. What three words? A lot of you might have heard of what three words as a way of giving your, your actual position. Be aware that if you misspell your what three words, so, you know, if you, if you take a word such as beams, B-E-A-M-S, and you put in, instead of hitting the S, you hit the Y, and you say that you're at beamy, that puts you in a totally different position altogether. So just be careful as you use what three words. So to summarize what we've talked about today, be prepared, check weather and tides, choose your spot, go with a buddy and have the right equipment. If in doubt, don't go out. No matter how much preparation you do or how experienced you are, if a swim doesn't feel right, there is no shame of getting out of that water straight away or not entering that in the first place. Always ensure someone knows where you're going, when will you be back, and what to do if you're not back. The most important part of that is what should they do if you do not return on time. Make sure you're acclimatised to avoid cold water shock. Be seen, wear a bright coloured swim hat and take a tow float. Stay within your ability. Float to Live. So the RNLI's got a campaign called Float to Live that some of you might have seen advertised. And what that's all about is if you do get into trouble, if you take a cramp or maybe you start to feel unwell, please roll onto your back, go like a starfish, put your arms and your legs out, extend them as much as you possibly can, and just do small sculling movements with your hands and your feet. You will be able to float shout for help and somebody will get to you as quickly as they possibly can. And remember 999 or 112, ask for the Coast Guard if you're at the sea and rescue, fire and rescue if you're inland. Preventing false calls, something that I wanted to bring up with you, we've seen a massive increase in the amount of people who are using um, open water swimming as a way of getting fit, maybe as part of their, um, their training to do their triathlon, etc. And most of the calls that we get to these people are false calls with good intent. So if you can at all, put someone ashore or have a support vessel with you, whether that's a kayak or a rib, somebody that can keep an eye on you and tell people ashore that you're okay and you do not need help. Try to swim in an organized event where the local rescue groups or the, the Coast Guard know what you're doing and they already understand that you're in the water and it's not something new to them. Please wear a bright cap and a tow float. It instantly makes you recognizable as an open water swimming as opposed to somebody that maybe have just fallen in. Clothes and valuables. Don't leave your clothes and valuables on the beach. The amount of calls that we get to somebody who's left an item of clothing on the beach that have just been swimming where they're not sure if you're out or whether you're still in the water. So be very, very careful with that. Plan the swim and swim the plan. OK, figure out what you're going to do. Share that with somebody and swim that plan. <coughs> Excuse me. If you decide to go to the beach and turn left and somebody reports you as missing, we know that you've gone to that beach and you turn left. If you go to that beach and start to turn right, you're in a totally different search area that we are not looking for you in to begin with. 
question and answer session. Please feel free to put any questions that you might have that are on the chat and I'll see if I can answer them for you. I noticed somebody there that there, somebody saying there's two areas of inland water that's covered by the RNLI. At the moment in Scotland, the only place that's covered by the RNLI inland is Loch Ness, but there's also a loch in Ireland as well. I can't remember if it's Loch Nee, um, but yeah, there is a couple of places that's covered as well. What three words? What is what three words? It's a, a totally free program which you can download onto your mobile phone, which will give three words which instantly identifies your current position. They say it's accurate to within about four to five square meters. So, you know, you, you, where you're sitting now, if you download the What Three Words app, you can press that and it might say to you, Red Caravan River three words which are totally unique to that particular square as it's been divided up across the coast, sorry, across the whole of the UK. Um, YouTube links, yep, I'm more than happy to share this presentation. So all the YouTube links will be there. Um, I'll send that through to Louise, Craig Lee and Sean, and they can share that with the attendees today. Michael, there's also a question further up, just so it doesn't get yep. lost on, would a seal attack unprovoked or when protecting a pup, etc.? Yeah, as soon as you put a hand anywhere near a seal, it will try to attempt to bite you. Um, you. Think about it as an untamed dog. It's, it's virtually exactly the same. You wouldn't go up to a dog that you didn't know and try and clap it or get close to it because the dog doesn't know you. It, it's not that they're necessarily aggressive, they're, they're quite scared. Um, they could either do damage to you, but you can also do damage to the seal. If you were to go close to a seal who has a seal pup, that seal will move away and possibly not come back to the seal pup. So avoid, avoid, avoid at all times if you can. So yeah, we've got some follow-up ones from Christine, sorry. Would sometimes yep. they sometimes they swim up to swim as, as in seals, what would you do? Keep my fingers and toes somewhere close <laughs> that I could keep an eye on them. <laughs> Probably breathe in, turn my backside to the seal. Yeah, if a seal's inquisitive and come up to a swimmer, that's fine. That's on their um you, you know, that's up to them. They, they've made that decision. They're coming to see you because they're interested. They're not scared if they come close to you, so they're less likely to to bite. Um, as I say, the, the, the time where a friend of mine was bitten, they actually approached the seal and put their hand out to it, which was why they got bitten. Sorry, that's my dog trying to come into the office. <laughs> Any more questions from anybody? Yeah, there's a couple more, Michael, in the yep, of course. chat box. Um, what is the best time to swim two hours before high tide with lots of question marks? Uh, not necessarily. Um, you need to know the local conditions, depending on the, the height of tide, whether it's a spring tide or a neap tide, there's loads of different calculations that could be done. It probably will come down to local knowledge. Um, people that swim that particular area all the time will know the, the, the times where it's slack tide, which is the best time to swim. Um, if you do enter the water, be aware that that could change at any time. So just be aware of it and don't overexert yourself and always have a plan B. Always have a plan B. So uh, th th there's not a catch-all answer for that. It it's down to be able to study a chart and look at the, the chart and know the time of high water. Um, from the time of high water, you can tell how many hours you are before that, and the chart will give what's called tidal diamonds. So the nearest tidal diamond to the place that you're going swimming, it will give you an indication of the approximate direction of tide and the strength of it. Great, thank you. Um, next question. There are lots of Fox 40 whistles. Do you re recommend any particular one? <laughs> I've got a close colleague who could spend the best part of an hour telling you the difference between all the whistles to me the worst the best whistle for you is the a the one that you're carrying because if you don't carry it it's no good to you so it's got to be something small and compact that you can easily attach that's not going to become an encumbrance to you 
So yeah, you could probably get a really big whistle, which would cause drag, um, it get caught up and everything. That's not the one for you, because you'll just end up taking it off your cat. So look for something small, compact, which is loud, and be aware when they fill the water, then they don't work to their best. So you may have to tap the water out of them before blowing, but yeah. Try them out. There's loads of good ones out there. Acme Thunderer is probably the one that most people will be able to find on eBay and things like that. That's you also get ones which are made specifically for life jackets. Be aware that a lot of them are cheap rubbish. They're just there to fulfill the purpose of meeting regulations. Go for something like an Acme Thunderer, which will will give you a half decent um noise and there's there's storm whistles out there there's there's loads of different types which are quite good um thank you right next one's my question do yeah. you mention checking the weather forecast is there any particular app or weather forecast you would recommend to check Scotland specific <sighs> Yeah, it, again, it comes down to that particular area in Scotland, the West Coast for a while, the best one that I ever found was there.tv, which was T-H-E-Y-R.tv. Um, the reason that was a good weather forecasting system was because it was based in Iceland and a lot of the, the, the weather patterns that came into that particular area that I was staying in um, came from Iceland. So it was pretty damn accurate because two to three hours it was over the top of Iceland. Um, Magic Seaweed gets a good reputation because all the surfers use it. Um, there's loads of different ones out there, but but rate it. If, you, if it doesn't give you, you know, if you're going to the beach just for a wander or you're going to a particular area and you find that that weather forecast is not quite as accurate as you want it, it probably isn't a good one. There's loads of different types out there. You'll find one which is good for the area that you're using that is accurate. Great, thank you. Then next question is, any advice for if you get stung by a jellyfish? <laughs> oh yes, there's loads and loads of advice if you're stung by a jellyfish. If I was to be really rotten and it was some day that I, think I would be talking about using a certain bodily fluid on top of the sting, which would get it out. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even attempt it. You just end up getting arrested for exposing yourself. Little packets of um, vinegar from fish and chip shops and things like that's usually pretty good. Um, that's what I've used before in the past. Yeah, it, when you're diving, the only bit that's actually exposed is that bit there. And it, again, SOD's law, which I sign up to, it's the top of the lip that gets you. So the last place you want anybody peeing on you is anywhere near your face. So yeah, the vinegars have a good good shout. Yeah, there's a famous Friends episode with such antics and more. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions for Michael? So if I'm, yeah, if I may, I'll just put my final slide on and um, if there's any other questions, I'll do it after this one. So hope you're all good. Look after each other, pull on your emotional life jacket and keep each other afloat. There we go. I'll see you again tomorrow at the usual time. Frank, get the door. Oi, get your aim script, that's my line. Why is she giving it, Frank, get the door? Frank doesn't even know So that. there we go. Even Nicola Sturgeon is advising you that you should be wearing a life jacket, even if it is an emotional life jacket. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Michael. That was great. And I think for me, my key learning point was that you double your chance of survival if you're with someone else. So, so many top tips in there. So huge thank you from Triathlon Scotland and everyone on the webinar this evening.